Never was it God's intention for us to live a life with anxiety, for us to live a life of stress. God's heart and desire was for us to always be in unity and alignment with Him. And so we are gonna offer something that is called the blessed life. It is a financial stewardship study that is truly gonna change the way you think about finances. God's intention from the very beginning was for us to trust Him because He wanted our hearts to be aligned with Him and He wanted to have a life of blessings for us. Tithing is a principle that is all over the Bible. In Genesis chapter 14, 19 through 20, this was the first example of a tithe. It says, and He blessed him and said, blessed be Abram, God most high possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. As God continued to lead people and as God continued to challenge those, we see over scripture and over and over that the tithe was something that he wanted us to take serious. And the only topic in the entire Bible that he actually asked us to test him. In Malachi chapter three, verse eight, nine, it says, will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have I robbed you? And he says, in your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse for you are robbing me the whole nation of you. And this was just a moment where God was reminding those that followed him that there's a better way of living. We talk about tithing, we talk about giving every week at South Hills. We wanna take six weeks to walk you through a journey that is going to transform your heart and transform your life. And we're gonna be offering it on a Tuesday evening at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time where you can log in online. So I'm gonna ask you to take some time to join us on this series. And our CFO is actually gonna be hosting and leading us through it. His name is Steve Robinson. And you can email him to reserve your spot, steve.robinson at southhills.org. Don't want you to miss it. Why? Because it truly is going to bless your life. I'm excited for this conversation. It's going to be a really, really great conversation. Uh, but before we get into that, I know last week we talked about um, we talked about triggers, and triggers can be things that kind of cause us to go down a spiral of um, maybe anxiety or depression. And um, uh, there was something I talked about. One of my triggers being um, divorce uh, because of just what I experienced growing up, right? And so, uh, but I realized there was something that happened in our country a couple weeks ago. Um, that I did not talk about last Sunday, um, and I realized because after processing a little bit, that is a trigger for me. Um, but I think it's an important thing for us to talk about considering the conversation that we're having. Um, if you don't know who I am, or if you don't know like my ethnicity, um, I get a lot of guesses. Polynesian, Hawaiian, um, Samoan. Um, I've even gotten Hispanic, believe it or not. Um, that one I didn't understand. but. Um, but my mom is Korean, my dad is black, um, and growing up in the South in Atlanta, uh, people didn't necessarily perceive me to be Asian. I think when we lived in New York, that was the perception, I just have more Asian features. Um, and even out here in LA, uh, just because of the population um, and the culture, there's, you know, people perceive me maybe to be Asian. Um, but in the South, growing up, people just perceived me to be a black kid. Um, and so, um, you know, if, you, if you're not aware of what happened a couple weeks ago, there was a shooting that happened in Buffalo and, um, where a young man um, specifically went into a grocery store targeting black people to kill them. Um, now, look, I've been the first one to say that I think there are a lot of situations that happen in our country that are just unfortunate situations that involve a black person and a white person. Um, but this is not one of those situations. Uh, the, the young man who committed these uh, crimes is... Uh, blatantly said that he specifically targeted black people. Um, and, uh, and the reason I'm sharing this is because it, it, I realize that this is a trigger for me based on things that I've experienced growing up. Um, I've shared with you guys that I've been pulled over multiple times for no reason. Um, one of those instances, Tess was in the car with me, where we are surrounded by cops for no reason with all of their hands on their gun. 
um, not knowing what's happening. And so um, all of those things are a trigger for me. But the reason I share that is um, I don't believe that racism is simply a political issue. Um, I believe it's a humanity issue. And if it's a humanity issue, then it has to matter to God. Um, God gave the most precious thing that he has um, in his son, Jesus Christ, for who? All of humanity. So humanity matters to God, and racism is a humanity issue. It's um, how we choose to see people. And, um, and it's not just, look, historically in our country, it's a black-white thing, um, but their racism exists in, in all aspects. I mean, you can even point to what's happening in Ukraine right now. You may not think of that as a race issue, but at its like foundation, it's about their identity. It's about their ethnicity. That, that's a problem. And so um, I, I just think we see it in all aspects. I, I've experienced racism on the Korean side of things, right? Because I'm not full Korean, we've been treated differently, right? And so it's, it's you know, but historically in our country, it is a, a black-white thing. And in this situation in Buffalo, it's a black-white thing. And I think sometimes we like to skirt around it, right? Um, rather than, I think, doing, honestly, the best thing that we could do is just say, yeah, that was a form of racism, um, and it was a black-white issue, and it shouldn't have happened. Um, and so um, the reason I'm sharing this is it's a trigger for me, but I got to believe that the black people that are a part of our church, um, black people that maybe are in your life, can I just tell you that it's probably triggering for them as well, even though it's not actually happening to them, they see themselves in the people who were killed. Because I immediately think about, well, that could have been my dad. Or if I happened to be in Buffalo, would they have perceived me to be black? Uh, would they have tried to kill me, right? And it's a triggering thing, it's an emotional thing. And so um, can I just encourage you to do one thing? If you have black friends in your life, can I just encourage you to maybe reach out to them and say, hey, I know I saw what happened in Buffalo. Um, how are you doing? That's all that it would take for them to know that they are not alone. Um, and I think sometimes we're, we're hesitant to even do that because we're like, well, I don't know really how to have that conversation or what to say or, or just ask them how they're doing. Ask them if you could pray for them. Um, that's all it takes. And, um, and so um, I felt like it was important to, to share that with you guys. Um, and it's just the world that we live in. And it's a sad reality, but I still believe that God is good. To believe that God is faithful, still believe that God is working, um, and, and he's wanting to use us to make this world a better place. And so before we get into this conversation this morning, uh, let me pray for us. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done. God, I thank you that in the midst of everything happening in our world, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you are still a good God. You are faithful. You are always who you say you are. And Father, I pray for the families that are impacted uh, but what, ha what happened in Buffalo? God, we can't, uh, we can't go back and, and make what happened not happen. Um, but God, I just pray that your peace would abound over those families. God, the peace that we read about in your word, which tells us that, that your peace is a peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray that that peace would abound over those families. I pray that you would be their comforter during the season as they grieve and they mourn uh, the, the, the lives that were lost. And God, at the same time, I pray for the young man who killed those people because the crazy reality is that you love him as well. And, uh, and so, Father, I pray for, for him. Pray that you would somehow reach uh, his mind, his heart, and his soul to help him understand the gravity of what he's done at the same time, God, as crazy as this is, to understand that you died for him. And God, I pray that we would not be separated by our differences. We would not be divided by our differences, but would you help us to understand that we are all fearfully and wonderfully created in your image? God, I thank you that um, you chose for me to be half Korean and black. It wasn't just a random design, but God, this is what you chose for me. But God, I thank you that first and foremost, my first identity is a son of God covered by your blood. And so, Father, I, I pray that it would not be our differences that divide us, but it'd be our differences that you would show us actually make us better. We love you. We bless you. 
Be with us as we have this conversation. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Um, I'm excited to uh, have this conversation with my mother-in-law. Um, the morning has been incredible so far. And um, excited for you guys to get to hear from her. Um, we're grateful that they made the trip all the way from Richmond, Virginia, to be with us today. And uh, people will cheer because you're from Virginia. South okay, so what part of South Carolina? Okay, I love Greenville. I'm from Atlanta, so. I want to say real quick how powerful that Jesus is closer to your skin color. Yeah. Thank you. And that's amazing. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Lindsay, where, you from Virginia? Yeah. What part? Danville. Oh, okay, awesome. Okay, a little Virginia in the house. Um, you know, whenever we ask them to come, we have a really good reason for them to come. Um, and uh, I think we have a picture of this reason on the screen. I mean, how could you say no to seeing him? Um, So it's a pretty easy decision uh, for them to come and spend time. I mean, look at that kid, man. Gosh. Um, So if anybody wants to be his manager or representation, um, y'all are laughing. I'm not kidding. We got to pay for his education somehow. So um, we got to use those dimples while we can, okay? Um, but no, uh, we're just grateful that she chose to be a part of this conversation because uh, she could have said no, and, um, but we're grateful that she's here um, as we talk about what are people getting better doing? What are people getting better doing? And so I want to invite my mother-in-law to come and join me. Can we welcome her? <laughs> Lori is very excited. Lori, this is... This is that's, this is Lori's girl Lori's right my here. Friend. Yeah. Um, but uh, really, you know, we've been talking about mental health and, and all these things. And, uh, you know, the first couple of weeks we talked about really what is depression, you know, trying to understand what it is. And um, because only when we understand what something is, can we actually find health or find like the, the journey forward. Um, and so we want to kind of turn the, the next couple of weeks to really talk about what does it look like to get better? Um, and um, if you're taking notes, our big idea for this whole conversation this morning is uh, recovery requires us to acknowledge and address our pace, patterns, predicaments, and perceptions. Recovery requires us to acknowledge and address our pace, patterns, predicaments, and perceptions. And so I really quickly want to unpack a couple of these things. Uh, pace is how fast we go and how much we do, right? And when we hear pace, I think we typically think of, I need to slow down. Um, but I think there's some instances where you actually need to speed up, especially um, you, you might be at a point um, with your mental health where the longer you wait, um, the worse it's going to get. And so you actually need to accelerate the pace at which you are seeking um, help. Patterns are about how we do what we do on repeat. Um, this can be negative, but it can also be positive, right? Right. Um, I think a lot of us can address and identify maybe the negative patterns that we've created in our life, but the journey to recovery requires us to then do the inverse, which is to create healthy patterns um, and healthy habits that are going to help us get well. I think about it like this. If you change your setting without changing your habits, you'll stay stuck. So many of us think about, um, well, you know, I'll just go see a different therapist or I'll just go to, I'll just go to this environment. I'll put myself in this environment without really changing what we're doing. And, you know, we get months down the road and we're like, I'm still in the same place. Why? It's because you haven't actually changed the patterns of how you live and the things that you're doing, the decisions that you're making that would actually lean you towards the journey of health. Uh, Predicaments are what's happened to and around us and what it requires of us. Uh, I talked about earlier, divorce is a trigger for me because of what I experienced in my upbringing. I also have to understand that's something that's happened around me, um, and, and it's, it's something that I had to go start to go to therapy for and counseling for to understand um, what it's required of me, capacity-wise, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Um, and so it's only when we start to understand some of the things that have happened to us, some things that are out of our control, uh, some things that are, we do have control over, uh, we have to understand how those things are consuming our capacity um, in order for us to move forward. And last is perceptions, how we look at life and what we repeat to ourselves. Uh, Some of us have a skewed view of of something, and that skewed view causes us to then have a negative experience of that thing. 
Um, so many of us maybe have a skewed view of church or faith or religion. And so regardless of what church you go to, with that skewed view, you're going to have a negative experience, right? So it's not necessarily about the church being bad, but what if it's your perception of church in general that's causing you to have a negative experience, right? The same is true when it comes to getting uh, healthy mentally. Um, if we don't have the right perceptions towards a recovery journey, then our experience won't be one where we experience recovery. It will be one where we experience exactly what we perceive. Um, and so we have to kind of understand those things before we lean into um, this conversation this morning. But um, I would love it if you would just share a little bit about who you are, what you do, and yeah. Good morning, church. How are you guys? <laughs> nice. Wow, this is awesome. <laughs> my favorite good, service, I told good you. response. That's great. Smaller crowd, great response. Um, so my name is Stephanie. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I specialize. I can treat, you know, um, lots of different general areas, but I specialize um, with marriage, obviously, um, as well as uh, trauma and OCD. And so currently I'm working um, mainly in the area of OCD and anxiety-related um, areas right now. Awesome. And so I, I think uh, one of the things that's been clear throughout the series, just from conversations that we're having um, throughout the week with people, um, is that because this conversation hasn't happened in the church um, historically, uh, or uh, mental health, whenever you've, you know, we've had people share with us that, yeah, when I brought my mental health struggles to someone in the church, um, I've been met with, well, you just need to pray more, or you just need yeah. to uh, read the Bible more, or you need to worship more, you need to lift your hands higher, um, you know, or you need to sing louder, right? Um, we're met with that, and I think that causes us to have the wrong perspective, perception, relationship with counseling and therapy, period. I know when I started seeing a, a therapist, I was on staff at a church, and I felt a significant amount of shame because I felt like, man, like I'm working at a church and I still need to see a therapist. Something is really wrong with me. Like, God, what am I not doing, right? That's what my head went because of the culture that predominantly, I think, dominates most church contexts around this issue. Um, and so, as a Christian, what is the right perspective or relationship to have towards counseling and therapy? So, I think the core heartbeat of this question is that really all truth comes from God, okay? And when you recognize, I mean, Proverbs um, 4, 5 talks about get wisdom, get understanding. And so, we've learned so much with about the brain, about how our brain can heal. You know, we see, you know, we get a cut and it heals. That's God at work, right? But our brain can do the same thing through, it's what's called neuroplasticity. So there's so much information that they've learned about how we heal and can change. And so uh, bringing that back to realize that, you know, God is at the center of this. And even if it may come in a different package, he's the one that brings the mm -hmm. truth, right? All truth comes from him. So that's the first thing. Second thing I would say about that is, this is a really important conversation to have in the church. Right? We're all whole people. We're physical, we're mental, you know, we've got emotional, all these different things, and we've separated them. And that's why there's this stigma. You know, if you went to the doctor, let's just say you, you went to the doctor about a physical, you know, issue and ailment that you were having, you wouldn't question that. You wouldn't have an issue. But as soon as, just like Quincy mentioned, you've got a mental issue or an emotional um, situation that's going on and you're struggling with it. It's, you're a whole person, but we've stigmatized that area. And the reason why it's so important that we're having this conversation here is we're the body of Christ. We need to be the trend in this on how we accept that we are whole. We get it. We understand that. And so normalizing that you can come down for prayer about, you know, a physical issue. You can come down for prayer and get next steps for mental and emotional stuff. Mm. Just normalizing it. That's good. Um, for those of you who don't know, Quincy's my first name. Uh, just wanted oh. to clarify that. Some of y'all are like, who is Quincy? Right? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I go by JR, as well, so she calls me Quincy. I just wanted to clarify that. It's a, um, mo it's a mom thing, you and, know. Uh, Quincy? Uh, but I, I, I love how you talk about we, we are like a whole being, right? And um, last week we talked about depression being uh, like uh, experiencing deficiencies in three categories, nature, nurture, and neighborhood. Um, and those three categories kind of make up who we are, right? So nature is about our biological makeup, our brain chemistry, 
Um, nurture is about our upbringing and just maybe habits uh, based on where we live or how we grew up that we've created over time. And neighborhood being who we surround ourselves with and what we have access to. I think all of those things kind of touches on the, our, our human experience as a whole person. Um, and so um, we talked about it more so, I think, from a biblical perspective that when I look at the Bible and we talked about Elijah, who drops into a deep depressive state. And how God calls Elijah out of it is he tells the angel uh, to, to, to touch him and tell him to get up and eat something. That's what the angel tells Elijah. Now, we talked about how that doesn't sound super spiritual. <laughs> but what if God knew that, that what Elijah needed was fuel in his body to actually function properly? And so um, we talked about how, you know, if we're suffering from depression or anxiety or any mental health challenge, uh, to recover from that then requires a holistic approach. And so as a licensed therapist, do you uh, believe that recovery also requires a holistic approach? Absolutely. Um, and that was a great point that you had last week. I wish I would have been here to hear it. Um, but we are whole, you know, body, mind, and spirit. And what we put and fuel in these areas and what we do about these areas is important. So I just kind of want to break them down a little bit, you know, and... Um, why a holistic approach is important. First of all, our body, as simple as this sounds, what you eat makes a difference. You know, we all know that um, what we uh, eat affects us, good, bad, and the ugly, right? Yeah. And so it does have an impact on us. What we put in our body on a negative side can as well, right? If you're using alcohol and drugs to numb pain, obviously that's gonna have a negative effect on, on you, right? At the same time, you know, um, you know, alcohol in moderation or drugs for helping you as a resource can be a really positive thing. And you guys have talked a little bit about medication, correct? Yeah, yeah we talked about that. We also talked about how Oreos are vegan. <laughs> so you can put as many of those in your body. As, look, vegan for me means it's healthy, okay? So Oreos is always a good thing. Amen. Right? There amen. You go. Can we get an amen? All right. Good. We should be passing them around I, right now. I know. Don't you think I of know. That? Anyway, so, so what we fuel our body with matters, right? Exercise, okay? We think that that's such a simple thing, but it, the reality is when you do exercise, it actually produces uh, serotonin, which is natural, healthy, happy chemicals, which is a really cool thing. Now, it doesn't mean you have to go out there and start working on a half marathon. It could be just movement, going for a walk. But they've found in studies that your exercise can be just as valuable as medication. When you, when you put that in perspective, you think, wow, it's free to go on a walk, right? It costs me something to get medication. Yeah. So it's something to keep in mind. Another thing, um, as, again, as simple as it sounds, uh, it's kind of neat how God is really simple in a lot of ways, right? Um, but uh, sleep. You know, sleep is really, really important. If you don't get enough of it, at some point, it's going to affect you physically and mentally and emotionally, right? And so I recommend a thing, um, sleep hygiene. Having good sleep hygiene is a really important thing. Uh, you just saying sleep hygiene like we know what sleep hygiene is. <laughs> I know what hygiene is. What is sleep hygiene? <laughs> so sleep hygiene is basically... Um, there's a lot of things to sleep hy hygiene, you know, what type of routine do you find yourself in? So what we're going to be talking more about is the mind, but really we train our mind. A lot mm. of the things in mental health are about, you know, what we're telling ourselves, different things like that, but we can train our brain. And so having a routine of when you sleep, figuring out how much sleep fits for me, I mean, you might do well with six hours. I might need nine. I mean, and that's okay. Tess needs 14. Ten, Tess needs 14. <laughs> oh my goodness, he just threw her under the bus and she's not even here to defend herself. She, she can hear it. I will defend her right now. Anyway, so, <laughs> so finding out what's a good fit for you is important. Caffeine. You know, some people can have a coffee at five o'clock and be okay. Some people can't have something past nine. I mean, I, you know, we're just all different. And so finding those things out. And the other thing is, um, one of the things they recommend is turning off all of your, you know, electronics, computers. Um, I know you're like, oh goodness, uh, 30 minutes before you go to bed. So no putting your phone in your bed. The last thing you do is send a text or look at Instagram, right? It's actually not helpful because you're stimulated mm. with all that light. 
And so you want to shut it down and teach your body. You're training your body. It's time to go to sleep, right? There's other things you can do, like progressive muscle relaxation, which when you're in your bed, it teaches your body how to relax so they can settle down and things like that. So those are just different things as far as your body. Now I want to talk about the mind. The mind is a really important piece, and it's part of our wholeness. And um, we tell ourselves a lot of things that don't help us, okay? Um, and so I want to show you guys a little example of this with a little diagram of how our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors all affect us, okay? Good or bad. And I want to show you that by a little um, one example of a thought, okay? So go ahead and put that thought up there. Okay, what if you had the thought, I am not loved, all right? That's definitely a negative thought, right? And you can put in any negative thought that you would have and do this same thing, okay? But I want you to watch this one. I am not loved, and then what it leads to, that thought leads to you feeling a certain way about yourself, okay? And those feelings are, they can be loneliness, sadness, despair, anger, hopelessness, right? And when you feel that way, what happens is that impacts what you do, your behavior. And what we end up doing when we have thoughts, like for instance this one, your behavior might look like isolation, withdrawal, pushing people away. And as you can see, the whole cycle goes around because when you do that, when you push away, when you isolate, it ends up confirming the very thought wow. you had. Wow. I'm not loved, no one cares, right? when it's not really true necessarily at all. And so what I'd like for you guys to recognize here is that we tell ourselves these negative things and I want you to get an understanding of some of the things we're telling us leads to how we feel. And if we can just kind of stop, and I, I like to recommend two things, uh, stop that thought and think of what's actually true. Try to tell yourself what are the facts. So if you thought, I'm not loved, um, What's some evidence that you could say that that's not true, Quincy? Uh, my son loves me. My son loves me, okay, perfect example. My son and your wife loves you and I she love you. She loves me, yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, or my friend, my coworker appreciates me. You know, all these little things, those are the facts, right? So that's the lowercase t, it's two t's. What's the truth, lowercase t? And the second t is capital T. What does God's word say about me? Hmm. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He knows the hairs on my head, right? That's the truth, no matter what. And so if we can remind ourselves of what is true, we actually stop that thought and we all of a sudden reframe of actually what is true. And you know how you take a picture and maybe it might be an old beatered looking picture, but you put it in a new frame and all of a sudden, boom, it pops. Mm. That's what you wanna do with your thoughts, right? You wanna recognize what's really true, okay? So that's the mind. Um, and I want to use the, that particular diagram. I, I have a little example. There's uh, several, um, lots and lots of people who have jumped off, um, attempted suicide and, and you know, uh, jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. But there's two gentlemen, and I have uh, one of those particular, there's two gentlemen that actually survived the jump of jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. There may be more, but I know about two. And one of them, his name is Ken Baldwin, he has a, he's quoted um, as saying the, this statement, and he said that he thought this thought right after he jumped, okay? And the statement is, I instantly realized that everything in my life that I thought was unfix unfixable was totally fixable, except for having just jumped. Hmm. So if you can use this as an example, obviously this is kind of extreme, right? But if you can use this as an example and realize how and what an impact our thoughts can have on us, right? And thank goodness he survived that one. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, the spirit, you know, mind, body, and spirit, your spirit. What do you fill your spirit up? The Bible says the Holy Spirit is the paraclete called alongside to help right? He's right with you to help you. And what are you feeding your spirit man? It's a big portion of you. And one of the things we do to feed our spirit is, you know, our time in worship here, our time gathered together as a body and of believers, um, being a community, that makes a big difference. Prayer, all those things. So I see that as more of a holistic approach. Yeah, that's really helpful. I, I think, um, 
you know, also when we think about recovery, and I think, you know, we're, we're all human, so I think we struggle with this, but I think in, I've seen it, you know, maybe more so in the church, um, that when it comes to any sort of journey, um, we love to compare our journey with someone else's journey. And we kind of expect that, well, you know, if, if they got better in two weeks, then I should get better in two weeks. And so um, I don't know if that's the right way to think about it. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, do you think everyone's journey to getting better with their mental health looks the same? Um, and if there are any sort of commonalities, things that maybe are similar that you've seen um, that do stand out to you as being kind of commonalities, what are those? So, so the first part of that question, um, are we all the same in that journey? No, I think that we're all unique. And the same, you know, I'll, I'll use an example of, of how one medication for one person might work great. Another person, it might you know, lead to all kinds of issues, right? We're all unique, so our journey looks different. But some commonalities in that journey that I've seen on a regular basis um, as far as helping you with that, number one would be just being consistent, knowing that um, continuing to press in, continuing to, to be consistent with whatever it is, wherever you find yourself. It may be at different situations. Maybe you're not even going to therapy. Maybe it's just being consistent with being a part of community and not being isolated. That might be your consistency, and that's okay. Maybe it's consistency in your all the things for the body, right? Or maybe it's consistency of working on your journey through therapy and not giving up and taking the next step. And so that consistency is a really big key. The other thing is being kind to yourself. Um, it's so common uh, when I find people in therapy um, that what they're telling themselves is something that they would never tell their best friend. And so what we do is we talk a lot about, well, you need to be kind to yourself. You need to love yourself. You know, the Bible makes it clear to love the Lord your God with all your soul, might, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you can't love your neighbor if you're not learning how to love yourself as well. And so many times we think, well, that's selfish. You're made in his image. And if we keep beating ourselves up, we end up in that little cycle. So um, loving yourself, being kind to yourself, and caring for yourself is important. Also, support versus isolation. Support and that support and community is a really big deal. Um, being vulnerable. Um, part of being vulnerable is being willing to say, I really need help. And if we don't get to that place of telling someone, I need help, we're just, we just stay alone. So that's a really important key. Yeah, I, I think the vulnerability thing is um, a really significant thing because, um, you know, I could have the most amazing therapist um, who I am paying to, you know, help me. Um, but if I am not honest with that therapist, they can't help me to the degree that I need help. Right. And so, like, you know, I, I think about it like this. Uh, I, I recently had a physical um, and. Uh, my doctor, my primary care doctor, is asking me all these questions, right? He's asking me, like, what, do, what am I eating on a regular basis? And if I told him that I was eating kale salads and drinking green juices every day, <laughs> right, he, he can't really diagnose me to the best of his ability, right? It, it, what's interesting is if you look in the Greek, the word diagnosis actually means complete knowledge, meaning that uh, a doctor or a therapist or a counselor they need complete knowledge to make the right diagnosis. Um, but that requires vulnerability, right? And so um, I could pay a therapist, but if I'm not telling the therapist what is actually going on with me, they're not going to be able to help me. And so um, I, I think it kind of leads me to this question of, I don't think any of us in here, if we've realized that, man, I do have some mental health things that I need to address or navigate over the last couple of weeks, um, I don't think anybody in here is like, I don't want to get better. I don't think anybody's thinking that way, right? So if someone is in the room right now and they're like, hey, I want to get better, where do I start? What would you say? I would first remind you that God is with you, that you're not alone. He's with you in this process. Um, the next, probably the most important thing is, you know, don't, be, don't do things alone. You know, be willing to, um, don't, don't just continue to take it on yourself, but ask for help. And that may be, from a friend that may be taking the next step for therapy. Um, as far as um, 
uh, an important thing that you just brought up as far as diagnosis. I think diagnosis is really important. You know, what diagnosis is in my world, um, it's called a psychosocial, um, uh, psychosocial, now I can't even think of the word, psychosocial whole um, and mental, you're looking at all of the different aspects of a person to find out where they're at. That assessment helps us to treat and know actually where you're at in your journey and what things you're struggling with, how we can help you. So that would be a really important thing. Yeah, and I, I, I love those two things because I think that they speak to depression not being just one thing. I think we think, oh, if someone's depressed, it's like they need help, they need professional help. When uh, depression kind of exists on a spectrum is what we've been talking about. And so there's different severity levels that maybe require different treatment or different types of things to get down the path of health. And so uh, someone might be in a situation where they're struggling with depression and anxiety, but the severity level of it is um, at a place where if they just surrounded themselves with community and people that they trusted and people that they could be honest with, they would be able to find, like get, the, get to, towards a place of health mm -hmm. without actually seeking professional help. Um, but some of us may be at a point where the severity level is so great where we're like, I have those people and I'm still struggling um, that I do need to find a professional counselor or therapist. And so um, I know for me, when I was looking for a therapist, I didn't really know what to look for. I didn't know that was even a thing. I just looked at reviews and then I looked at like recommendations from other people. And then once I went to see a therapist, I was like, they seem nice. Um, they seem like they're a good listener, even though I'm paying them to listen to me. Um, so, but I think it's important, like thinking about it now and working with the therapist that I have now, I realize how important it is for us to maybe find the right person. And maybe we in the room don't realize that. And so, um, what should people look for in a counselor or therapist if they feel like that's their next step? What should people look for in a counselor or therapist, especially those of us who would say we have a relationship with Jesus? Okay. So a couple different things in there. Um, first thing is, you know, what should you look for? Well, what's going on with you, right? You know yourself the very best. What's going on? And when you're looking for a therapist, you want to make sure that you're looking for someone who actually has that knowledge and that wisdom in the area that you need to be treated, right? Not all, all therapists are going to be able to treat you in all areas, and that's okay, Right, for instance, um, I've seen several people that have seen like a, more of a general therapist, which is fine, I'm sure they were wonderful therapists, but the person actually had OCD, and the treatment actually caused their symptoms to increase, mm. okay, and they just didn't know. And so you knowing yourself and what's really going on is very, very important, first of all, so you can be looking for the right um, skill set in the person that you wanna go see. And that comes by you know, research, but also asking questions right it you're perfectly you know it's perfectly reasonable for you to want to ask questions about your therapist to your therapist right have a you know oftentimes they'll give you like a consultation you can ask them all the questions you want ask them different things you know tell them about your faith even and how it's important to you if that's something speaking of um you know that particular part of the question and you know just kind of feeling those situations out many times an individual can go in and actually uh, start with a therapist, but they recognize, wow, this isn't, you know, I don't really feel comfortable, I'm not able to connect, and that's okay too. I certainly don't connect with every person that walks into my office, and, and you have to be able to know that. And so being able to, you know, kind of, uh, like we talked about in a different... Um, Gotta test the waters a little bit. Yeah, right? test the waters a Like Tinder for therapists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gotta be able to swipe left and swipe right. There right? you go. I think it's a brilliant app, right? Like that, there should be like a Tinder for therapists, right? <laughs> Just saying, go. it's a million dollar idea. Watch, I'm telling you. So, a, any good therapist is going to be completely okay with that. Okay, they're going to be completely okay. Make sure that you're recognizing: are they antagonistic with your faith? That's a red flag, right? That's important to you. And so, those are some of the things. I think that also the fact that pastoral counseling is very beneficial. Like Quincy was saying, I don't think everyone needs to see a therapist, mm. even if you're feeling depression. Actually, depression, anxiety, and stress are pretty normal, especially in the world we live in, right? And not everyone needs to see a therapist. Mm. So finding out where you're at, doing some of the things that we talked about, and if you still feel stuck, take the next step, right? And so that's kind of how I would approach that. That's, that's, that's great. Um, 
Uh, can we thank my mother-in-law? Um, and uh, um, for uh, parents of kids at 1.30, um, she's going to be uh, back up here um, in this auditorium at 1.30. We're going to have a conversation around uh, talking to kids about mental health. Um, and she's going to lean probably more so into um, her OCD experience, realizing that um, uh, so much of OCD, uh, the, the root of it is rooted in anxiety. Um, and what we're seeing coming out of the last two years that we've had is more and more kids struggle with extreme anxiety. Um, and that will only increase um, over the years to come. Um, and so we want to make sure that we give parents things that they can look for to maybe realize that, oh, my kid needs help. Uh, one of the things that she shared with me yesterday was people don't know this, but um, depression in kids can be expressed or manifested as anger. Um, I think we just assume that it's like sadness, um, but it can actually be expressed um, through anger. And so um, we're going to have a conversation for parents. And, um, and, but I realized, look, maybe you're like, I, I don't have no kids, but I want to be a part of it. Um, you're more than welcome to sit in and, and join that conversation because I believe that some of the stuff she'll share will help everyone. And so um, that's happening at 1.30 um, in the auditorium. Um, but thank you so much for being with us today and for just sharing some of those things um, that are super, super helpful. Um, like that diagram, yeah. man. Like I, I think we just tell ourselves, I think we've told ourselves that like, oh, that's like some self-help gimmick. Um, when in reality, there's actual science behind it. Um, and so I just, man, it's that, that diagram alone is super helpful. And so um, hope that was encouraging um, for you uh, this morning. But we're going to continue in our worship through our time of giving. Um, and this is where we at South Hills, we, we bring our tithe, which is the first 10% of our income, back to God and anything that we want to give um, to above and beyond, we do that. Um, and I just want to say thank you guys for being such a generous church. Um, I personally want to take a moment to thank um, a specific group of people. Um, we are sending our middle school and high school students to summer camp this summer, um, which I'm super excited about. But I wanted to uh, thank some people, not by name, because they probably don't want to be known by name, but um, I wanted to thank some people. Um, there's some people in our church who have given generously uh, to sponsor middle school and high school kids to be able to go to camp without even paying for it. Um, and that is no small thing. And so uh, can we just thank those people for doing that? Um, but one of the things that we say at South Hills about generosity, that it's people's generosity that allows, uh, that creates and gives people the opportunity to live a better story. And because those people were so generous, um, I believe that middle school and high school kids are going to have the opportunity to live a better story. And, um, and so thank you guys. Um, a couple things before we get out of here. One thing we want you to know is Summerfest is happening on June 12th from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, this is going to be an incredible opportunity for us to kick off summer together. Um, there's going to be games, food, um, tons of fun for every person. We're bringing back the dunk tank. Um, I'm not getting in it this time, um, so don't expect that. Um, but Patricia is going to get in it. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I ain't going to put her on blast like that. I'm not going to do that to her. Um, man, I'm going to hear it tomorrow, y'all. Don't worry. Um, but it's going to be a lot of fun. We couldn't think of a better way to kick off summer than doing it with you guys, and so we want you and your whole family to be a part of that. That's happening June 12th, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., so save the date. Um, and then uh, one thing we want people to do is Extreme Week is happening. Um, Extreme Week is our summer day camp for kids who are in first grade through sixth grade. Um, and trust me, you do not want your kid to miss this week. It's going to be a ton of fun uh, where they're going to, I mean, like literally a ton of fun. This stage behind me will not look like this. Um, and, uh, and we're excited for our kids to be able to be in a safe, fun environment where they can uh, make friends, have fun, but also grow in their faith. Um, and I love the whole theme. The whole theme of it is about waves and the ripple effect that these kids can have to impact their world. Um, and so you can register for your kid at, in the South Hills Burbank app, or if you want more questions, um, if you have questions, uh, just talk to somebody in the Connect area. Uh, they would love to get you the information that you need. Space is limited, so you want to make sure that you get your kid registered for that. And parents, we're telling you, drop your kid off for a few hours. Let us tire them out, and then we'll give them back to you. Who doesn't want that, right? Um, and so um, also, maybe you're like, I don't have kids, but I would love to help and be a part of that. 
Um, if you want to volunteer that week with us, I'm sure Janet would love to have you. So um, you can just find Janet. She's probably in one of our kids' spaces right now. Um, but find Janet. Talk to her. She would love to have um, you volunteer um, with her for that week. But why don't we stand? Let me pray for us. Jesus, we love you. Thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. And God, I thank you um, for your word and your truth. I thank you that it's your word that transforms us from the inside out. I thank you that it's your truth that renews our mind. And God, I just believe that if you can change the way that we think, it'll change the way that we live. And so, um, God, we would continue to give you that space to change our mind. I mean, God, would you help us to shine your light in the darkest of places wherever you have us this week? We love you. We bless you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.